Good morning, good morning. If everyone can please turn to Matthew chapter 28. First, want to say just uh, good morning and happy, happy Easter. Um, I'm glad to see everyone here today. What I really love about Easter is that we are coming here to help and to celebrate something miraculous that happened on the world. You know, whenever we think about this, we think like, okay, well, what's something, what's the most miraculous thing that's ever happened in your life? Some of the brothers might be thinking, singing that high-pitched song without losing my voice. That's kind of how I feel this morning. Um, but but I, I know for me, the most miraculous thing that God pulled off in my life was allowing me to get married to Tegan. Um, the hardest part about all this was planning the proposal. See, for me, I already knew I was starting off as an underdog. Um, even when I started dating her, just to understand my character a little bit, church, the very next week, I forgot to take her out on a date. Um, so that's kind of how I was already like falling behind, you know? So even people that know me today, at best, people are just confused about who I am, you know? Um, but so I, I really had to start off looking at the proposal is this needs to be awesome. This needs to be great. Or she's going to look at the ring and say, no, that, that cost me like $200. But anyways, but you know, so I, we started planning it out. So a prior a couple weeks before, I got with uh, my brother and some of my friends here in the church and we started planning out the proposal. You know, we, we started talking about, okay, well, we're going to have an aisle of just petals, of rose petals down the aisle. We're going to have on each side just all these candles and at the end it's going to be shaped as a heart. You know, we're going to have everybody out in the balcony just hiding there and, and having like flowers for her and everything. And when she's walking up, we're going to have 10 little boxes of things that I love about her and a little something that she can take home. And uh, so we start planning it out. It needs to be awesome. It needs to be great. So what we did is, you know, right after church, what we planned is while everyone's preparing this for me, me and Tegan were going to go off into the center point tower and walk around up there. And uh, if you don't know me, that, that was a bad idea personally because I am terrified of heights. And, uh, but it was also kind of good because after we walked it, I was extremely nervous and she thought it was just because I almost died up there. But, uh, so, so it kind of worked out in my favor. But anyways, we get to the building where the preparations all have been made and I give her a little video to watch just so that it can distract her so I can run inside, change into a suit and get up there. But uh, while I'm running in there and, and start changing, I, I start checking my pockets and I notice I forgot the ring. <laughs> So the ring was outside next to Tegan in a bag. And uh, so my brother's there and others, and I'm just like freaking out at this moment. I'm like, guys, this doesn't work without the ring. You need to go out there and grab it. And they're like, no, 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 we can't do that yet. She's standing right there. It won't make any sense. So I'm like, I'm just freaking out. So I run up there where I'm supposed to be. Tegan starts walking in, and my brother becomes like a little ninja. He, you know, <laughs> sneaks around her, gets the ring. And uh, kind of when she's not looking, I'm pretty sure she saw him. But he runs up to me, gives me the ring. But uh, it was miraculous because at the end of the day, she said yes. Um, but when I look back at it, I, I notice that, you know, even when I talk about the most miraculous, the most amazing story in my life, and I compare that to Jesus, it does not compare to a mediocre day with Jesus. You know, when we look at the story of Jesus, when we read his story, there are so many amazing things. But what's the most amazing thing he did? Some people would say, well, him feeding the 5,000 out there, that was amazing. How did he do it? Him walking on water. What about him going to the cross? I want to say none of those, but it is the resurrection of Jesus. It was the most amazing thing he did. Let's read about this story in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. It says, after the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. So just to understand what's going on here, this is after Jesus crucified, and this is three days after, and they're going to look at to the tomb. Um, have you ever walked into a situation where you were clearly not ready for? Um, any man that's walked into a room with a woman crying knows what this means. Um, I remember the first time after getting married, um, I walked into my wife after she just got done praying and she was in tears. And for me, I kind of had like this fear of paralyzing. I like, what do you do, right? 
Um, so I walked up, and now, just, just to kind of give you an end of the story, she, she, she was okay, don't worry about it. But uh, so I walked in, and uh, not knowing what to do, I just kind of asked her, you know, hey, is, is everything okay, babe? You know? And through tears, she's like, yeah, everything's okay, you know? <laughs> I kind of just sat there for two minutes, like, clearly not. But, um, you know, sometimes you just walk into a room and you have no idea what you're going to do. And this is kind of what the Marys kind of walked in. They walked into there thinking, oh, they're just going to help see Jesus and say their goodbyes. But they walk into something totally different. Continuing on, there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lie. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. You know, it is amazing. To die and to come back to life was the most incredible thing Jesus did. So you'll read throughout the Bible that others, yes, they did come back to life, but it was very different with Jesus. Other people, they escaped death. Jesus, he conquered death by his own righteousness. And it was amazing just to see how he came back and he was still loving his brothers and sisters. If you guys like to turn to Luke chapter 24. See, and just to know when you read throughout the Bible, see, this is not medically correct. Some people want to think about that. To raise from the dead is not medically correct. Also, whenever you read throughout the Bible, sometimes you read throughout the Bible and it, it tells us of realities that science is just starting to understand today. This is not one of those. This is not one of those things that you want to go test and have a hypothesis on, trying to kill somebody and see if they come back to life. That's not one of these. It's also not one of those things, you know where the Bible says, hey, you have to test it out to see if it's true. This is also not one of those stories. The Bible is not saying go kill somebody and see if they come back to life. No, this is something that was particular to Jesus. But the thing that was most amazing is how Jesus came back. See, to change is very challenging, but to stay consistent can be one of the most impossible things you try to do. Yeah. And we're going to see how Jesus, he didn't come back with a limp. He came back just as he always was. So Luke chapter 24, these are people talking about Jesus, and they don't know that they're actually speaking to the risen Jesus. Verse 19, it says, About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and the other rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we have hoped that he was the one who is going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us, but they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, being Jesus, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to come to suffer these things and to enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It was awesome that these guys were talking about Jesus and they didn't really recognize that this was Jesus who they were talking to. I said, this Jesus, this prophet, he was powerful in word and deed before God. And they went along and just kept telling Jesus his own story. And Jesus kind of turns back to him and says, you guys still don't understand? And at this moment, he preached the longest sermon in history. 
He started from Moses, went throughout all the scriptures, and told him, guys, you need to understand this. And you would think by this point, they're at like point 17, Jesus is saying, Jesus had to die and everything. Like, Jesus, we understand. <laughs> Stop talking to us about this. He's like, well, it's not about just understanding. It's about having conviction. What I love about this is showed that not just Jesus resurrecting him, conquering death, but that Jesus resurrected with not a limp. He didn't come back and say, oh, is everyone okay? He came back as a same prophet, powerful in word and deed. So my sermon here today is called, The Same Jesus Rose from the Dead. We're not just going to merely focus on the resurrection, how most people do in Easter, but we're mainly going to focus on the resurrected Jesus. How did he come back, and how did he act after he resurrected? Point number one, rose with the same compassion. If you guys would like to turn to John chapter 21. Wow, that was very in unison, sisters. I'm proud of you guys. Uh, but let me ask you. Is compassion something that is taught or that is inherited from God? You know, there's a story about this young child named Josiah, five years old, and his mom, and they're in a Waffle House in America. And when they walked in, the first thing little Josiah noticed was that this dirty man in the corner of the restaurant. And it didn't take him long to start bombarding his mom with a lot of questions. And one of the most important is how they could help him. But first it started off with, Mom, 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 how, where, where does he live? Mom, why is he so dirty? Mom, where, where is his family? Mom, where does he keep his groceries? The mom turned to him, well, he doesn't have a home. He doesn't have many chances to take a shower or a bath. His family may be all gone. He doesn't have much food to keep. And the questions kept getting harder and harder for her to answer. Josiah, deep in thought, he sprang into action. He noticed that nobody was waiting on this old man. So he jumped up, grabbed a menu, and went to the, to the man and said, Hey, you need food. Order whatever you want. And the mom, accommodating her young child, went over, and not very long after, they started dining together. The mom allowed the man to order anything he wanted. And right before, right when the food came in, they were just about to dig in, but Josiah stopped them all and said, hey, well, we need to give a thanks of prayer first. <laughs> and right during that time, if you look around all the cafe, all the witnesses said not a single eye was dry at that moment. Everybody was in tears. You know, I believe that as this young son showed us, that I believe all of us, we've once had compassion or concern for others. We've once been at least the object of its greatness, of its love. But somewhere along the line, we start to lose it, don't we not? You know, we, start at, we stop asking of why we can help. Instead, we start blaming why they are in need. We stop caring for the damaged. Instead, we're, we're scared to be damaged ourselves. We're scared to, to see the pain because it's already been told a million times out there in the world. So we don't want to look at it anymore. You know, we, we don't want to be hurt. We've reached our limit. And this can even happen in the church. That we have the dream to go and seek and save the lost, but after one too many people turn their backs on us, we're like, no, I've, I've reached the limit. I don't want to do that anymore. And this is something that I'm, I'm very grateful that God is not like us in this moment. Where God is so above us, I give him praise for this. See, let's read in John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, and how Jesus came back to those that have hurt him. Afterward, Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, known as Dynamis, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said to him, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boats, but they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood by the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. 
You know, it's pretty awesome. If, if you thought this was like a drama story at this point, if this was like on HBO or whatever, you'd be thinking, well, wow, things are about to go down right now. Jesus just came back. He's facing the guys that just betrayed him. Let's see how this is going to go down. All right, he called out to them, friends, haven't you had any fish? No, they answered him. He said, well, yeah, that's because you betrayed me. No, no, he doesn't, he doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, throw your nets on the other side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard this, that is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, being a little bit more smart than Peter, towing the net uh, full of fish, and they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. Then they landed, they saw a fire burning, uh, burning, excuse me, a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter called back, crawl, climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was Jesus, excuse me, the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had raised from the dead. I think too many times we try to look at the huge miraculous things Jesus does, but we can pass too, too quickly over his re, uh, reaction to coming back to his disciples. It's quite crazy. When you read before this, you remember that not too long ago, just a few days ago, these guys have betrayed him. These guys left him when he was most in need. Yet Jesus came back still with the equal amount of love for them. He came back and he wanted to take care of his disciples. He showed them love. But yet his heart was still not broken for the people. You know, this is something we have to ask ourselves. Have, have, has your love died out for people? So many times we can go through life and say, well, I've been through something, an event in my life. And you tell yourself, I'll never be the same again. I, I can't love like that anymore. I'll never be able to be as vulnerable as I once was. And yet Jesus shows us that we can conquer these feelings as well. You know, in the same way, when we talk about going out and loving other people, you always have to ask yourself when we're in a church, well, do you go out and love the lost out of love or just out of duty? There's a big difference between sharing your faith and loving the lost. Huge difference. You can go out, invite people to church, but never love the lost. And people recognize it, and people notice that. And churches that do not teach to evangelize or to get their members to share their faith do not understand the love of Christ. How could they? It's only just, just for the people that are inside the church. What about the love that God had for everybody who betrayed him? Churches that don't teach that don't understand the love of Christ. See, Jesus, he died for them as much as he rose for them. Him coming back to life was greater than him just dying for them. See, keeping your love for the lost, for people in your life, is difficult. But we have to be able to give our heart again and again. See, most of us, it's, it's really hard because we give all our heart. We give it all and more, and yet we find it out just getting stomped on. People turning our backs on us. Just people, people walking away without being appreciated. But we have to learn how Jesus did. He, he came back with the same amount of love. This is really what I really want to encourage you guys with. Whatever trials you have gone through, you are going through or you're going to undertake, you cannot lose your compassion. We always talk about this. The world is not in suffering because of lack of money, food, or anything else. It's a lack of love. And the world's trying to tear us apart from us. I want to challenge everyone here, do not lose your compassion. Jesus, he came back with the same amount of love. 
He didn't come back limping or with a grudge or, or with any hurt. He came back and says, you guys need love more than ever now. Here, t take some fish. I want to show you that the miracles can still happen. I challenge you, have you have any loss of love for anyone in your life? Who have you lost your love for? Point number two. He rose with the same message. You know, what do you think was the main thing that Jesus preached about? Most churches nowadays would like to tell you, it's I love you. But I want to tell you, when you actually start reading in the Bible, you find that out to be very true. That he doesn't very say that much. Instead, he says this. He questions. He says, do you love me? See, God's love for us have never been in question. Has, has always be, been evident to all of us. But to God, he's like, well, what's in question is your love for him. Let's see if Jesus keeps preaching this same message. John chapter 21, verse 15 through 22. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to, his, to, said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. Third, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and said to, and saw the, that the disciple who Jesus loved was following them. This is the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked him, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? You must follow me. These are amazing words that Jesus is talking to Simon here. He asked him, hey, do you love me more than these? If we remember the story of Peter and how the very first time when Jesus came to Peter, he was out there fishing, not catching anything just like it was in this story. And he came to him. He says, hey, well, I'm not just going to have you and allow you to see that you can catch fish, but you are here to change people's lives. I want to call you and follow me to be a fisher of men. And yet after Jesus died, after he went to the cross and Peter saw that this was more difficult, than he thought it was going to be. Jesus comes back to him again. He says, hey, do you love me more than these fish? Yes, I love you. What, what are you doing, Peter? Why did you go back fishing? Why did you go back to your old life? Peter, you need to feed my lambs. See, Peter was supposed to be the one leading the church at this moment. But what Jesus found after he resurrected, that all the disciples have scattered. They have locked themselves in their own homes out of fear of persecution. And Jesus looked around and he says, Peter, I didn't leave the church this way. What are you doing? You are supposed to be here taking care of the sheep. And he asked them three times this. Jesus equated love for God for love for people. He said, if you really loved me, you'd be taking care of the disciples. See, more than anything, Jesus was just calling Peter to the same standards as he was before. Peter, when I first met you, I told you you needed to leave everything and follow me. It's the same thing after my resurrection. So many people can treat the risen Jesus with such disrespect, it's sickening. They treat his death and resurrection as a vehicle to just keep on sinning and to have more grace. 
Well, the Jesus rose from the dead, so the battle's already won. I don't, I don't need to change my life anymore. I don't need to repent. God has won the battle. All I need to say is, Jesus is Lord, and I can just keep sinning as I want. But what does the Bible say about these things? Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, if you want to turn there. So many people take this, they're like, well, God's already won the battle, but he's expect you to do something with it. Verses 1, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. Why should we live it any longer? Don't you know that all who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we, if, for if we have been unified with him in death like his, we would certainly also be unified with, with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that our body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has, has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with Him. What does it say here? It talks about people that whenever somebody just dies with Christ, that, that they're still worshiping just a dead God. That they're like, well, hey, I, all I'm here is I'm just getting baptized and Jesus forgave my sins so I can keep on sinning. He says, don't you understand that you can also live for him? So many churches want to preach about, hey, don't do this and don't sin. What about living for righteousness? Where is that being taught in churches? And so many people get into their mind, though, of thinking, well, what, but what if I can't? What if I can't change? What if these sins are too difficult to, to, to walk away from? I feel like I'm, I'm still a slave to these things. What if, what if I just can't do it? And people don't realize that, 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 that we are not just worshiping a dead Jesus, but we are worshiping a resurrected Jesus. The, the reason he re resurrected is so that we don't have to say that anymore. I know before I became a Christian, that's definitely how I treated my life. God, I, I can't do it. God, I tried and I try. I just can't. But the Bible here says that we cannot just continue to live a dead life. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. See, for Jesus, this wasn't just a game for him. It wasn't just another religion. It wasn't just another belief so that you can have a better life. It was a way to change those who loved him. But we have to understand that change is the goal. See, here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 27, it says, If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have, uh, excuse me, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. See, even if you keep on living your sinful life. Even the resurrected Jesus won't save you. He says, I'm not coming back again to die for your sins. When I come back, it's for judgment. See, most people come into church on Easter Sunday and they want to feel good about themselves. You know, usually people only come to church either on Easter or Christmas, but they come in and they're like, you know, they could have just been in like the nightclub the night before, could have been just living their sinful life, getting drunk, sleeping with women, whatever. And they come in and they're like, well, hey, hallelujah, I'm forgiven. Jesus resurrected. You know, all fired up and everything. But the, the Bible here says that you shouldn't be fired up if you live that way. It says you should be afraid. It says if you keep on living this way, you should be fearful. You should have a fearful expectation of judgment. See, I'm not here just to get down on everybody. It is Easter. Sorry about that, guys. But, um, you know, it, it is to encourage you that you do not have to live the same life that you're living. That you don't have to tell yourself, oh, I can't. Yes, you can. See, most people come into here like, well, well, the church is perfect. You're saying we have to be perfect. No, we are not perfect. And perfect people are actually not allowed in this church. 
Um, some people come in here and they think they're perfect. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a hug and say and try to convince you that you're not. But, um, you know, we'll do that out of love. But you just have to realize that, guys, we're not perfect. But we do need to change our lives. And I'm so glad that God has done that in our lives. See, even when I was converted, so I was converted when I was 18, so I'm 25 now. And, you know, when I was converted, I was 18, I had long hair, so you can visibly show, I kind of visibly showed the world that I didn't care. Um, but, you know, even back then, there, there were so many things in my life that I had idols before God. Uh, I, even in myself, I would be open about it. I was, I was very addicted to pornography, to masturbation, to all these things, and just my mind was warped about how to view women. And I, I always felt like I could never change these things. But I'm so glad that God didn't just call me to stop sinning, but he called me to righteousness. It wasn't just, hey, keep coming to church, be a Christian, pat yourself on the back. I'm so glad God did that. Because if I looked at my life, if I was still stuck in those sins, how would my marriage be? I, I couldn't stand up here and preach to you. I couldn't, I couldn't have done that. I couldn't call people to change if I hadn't done so. But I also wouldn't have done so if God didn't give me the ability to. And what I'm encouraging you guys with is that you don't have to tell yourself that you can't. Yes, you can. Then every single person has said, hey, if we went through the difficult times with him, if we died with him and having to change, it says you can also live with him. See the glory that he's a part of. One of my favorite scriptures here is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. You don't have to turn there, but it says, here is a trustworthy saying. So don't just believe in me, believe in the Bible. It says, if we die with him, we can also live with him. If we endure, we can also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. My second challenge here is that Jesus, when he came back, he came back preaching the same message. I want to encourage you. Are you living a true life for Christ? Are you living for righteousness? I want to encourage everyone, if, if this is something that's really on your heart, I want you to write down a sin that you still have not died to. I want you to go back home and find five scriptures to sh prove to yourself. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 that you need to think what is true. Whenever I find somebody lying to themselves where they say they cannot, I just pull out that scripture and say, you're a liar, bro. You think you can't? You're lying to yourself. The Satan wants to deceive you and teach you that you cannot change. No. So I want you guys to think about what is true. Get five scriptures to show yourself that yes, you can change. I want you also to write down something that you have, that you want to resurrect in your life. Something that you want to start doing, whether that's start praying more, reading your Bible, going out evangelizing, whatever God has called you to do in righteousness. My last and final point here, guys, is rose with the same dream. Turn, please, to Matthew chapter 28. Many of us, we lived and, and gone through so many different dreams in our lives. You know, when I was a young child, I remember that I thought the best job to get was to, have a, to be a construction worker. You know, I thought, wow, you're going to make bank. You're going to have so much money. You know, you're going to get ripped. And I, I thought that was like the best thing. Um, am I still living that, that dream today? No, I, I outgrew that. But, you know, sometimes even that, to stay consistent in your dreaming can be very difficult in this world. Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. Let's see what dreams Jesus still had after he died. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. See, some started to doubt the dream again. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Yeah, I wonder how these disciples would be feeling. I don't know if any of you guys grew up playing sport, but I don't know. I, I know for my um, last season playing American football, that was my favorite sport. For my last season, we had 10 games. We lost every single game. 
And uh, I remember there was one particular time that I remember the coach. You know, this is just one time we got blown out by like 50 to kneel. So there, there wasn't like any hope in our eyes, right? We went into the locker room just like crying. But uh, the coach came out, guys, we're going to win next week. We're going to go down there, march, and take the victory. And all of us were like, what in the world is coach talking about? <laughs> you know, I, I wonder, this is probably how the disciples were feeling, right? They just got conquered. Everyone was scattered. People were hiding in their homes. And here comes Jesus. Wow, this is awesome, guys. Let's go out into all the world and preach and baptize disciples. People are like, what in the world? Jesus is still dreaming here? You know what was awesome about this is that Jesus did not change his dream. He did not let the world affect his dream. Instead, he infected the world with his dream. See, so turn to John chapter 12. It talks about here that the same dream that Jesus had before his death was the same after. After all the pain, after all the betrayal. In John 12, verse 46 through 47, it says, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my word but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus came with a dream and he wanted to end with his dream. But again, people can start asking the same question. What if I can't live up to this dream? What if I can't do what Jesus wants me to do? What if, I, what if I still have doubt in my heart for the dreams that Jesus has for me? I want you to ask a more important question that's a more realistic question. Ask yourself, what if you can? What if the only thing stopping you is you? What if you had no more excuses of why you can't? What if you're not waiting for things to change? Not waiting for somebody to encourage you. Not waiting for somebody to say, hey, you can do it. Instead, you realize, yes, I can. See, that is reality. Nobody here can say, I can't. Yes, you can. You need to get yourself out of your own way. You see, this is what Jesus was doing. He was calling people to the same dream. He's like, guys, I know you kind of betrayed me and everything, but you can still change the world. I want to encourage everyone, have you started to lose your dream? You want to encourage me to be in this church because I start to see people getting the dream again. You know, you start seeing people in the New Zealand mission team grabbing the dream. You know, what's most encouraging to me is just starting to see the young disciples go into these things. You know, I hear about the story of Jesse Brower going to the, young, uh, to the, to the mission team. And, uh, you know, everybody else I heard, like, hey, I asked people, hey, how was, the, how was the New Zealand mission team night? You know, how was it? Um, you know, how was the sermon? How was it? Everyone's like, gosh, this is so hard. You know, it's going to be super difficult. We got to give up everything. Here's Jesse. This is what I'm looking for, you know? And, um, you know, you see this throughout everybody. If, if you guys haven't yet, if you start talking to Alex, who's going to get baptized today. You, know, you see him start adopting the dream. You start seeing the other Jesse, you know, start adopting the dream. Uh, we're going to have to give you another nickname. We have too many Jessies in this church now. But um, I, I really want to encourage, what about those who have stayed in the church for a couple of years now? Could I point to you and still say, hey, you have the dream? See, it's easy to get it in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. When you start seeing him do all the miracles, when you start seeing him feed the 5,000, walk on water, they're like, yeah, the dream sounds awesome. But when they saw Jesus die and people get crucified and, and the persecution come, Jesus was asking, hey, do you guys still have the dream? See, Jesus still has a dream in your life. You could be doubting. You could have been hiding away from your faith. And Jesus still looks at you and says, hey, you can change the world. Yeah. I want to encourage everyone. Do you still dream like Jesus' dreams? See, I think the story of Jesus is just amazing. Because not only did he do something that was impossible, but he came back with this amazing heart. 
He came back with the same compassion, the same love for people. He came back with the same message to call people out of their darkness into this wonderful light. He called people to the same dream even when they thought they couldn't do it. See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 14, ended off with this scripture in conclusion. It says, By His power God raised the Lord from the dead. He will raise us also. I want to encourage you guys. Let's live with the same compassion, the same message, and the same uh, dream of Jesus. And to God be the glory. Amen. <laughs>